Please remain standing as you are able for our scripture reading. Today's verses are from Isaiah 58, chapter, chapter 58, verses 4 and 6 through 11. The New Revised Standard Version, found in the Old Testament on page 688 in your pew Bible. Look, you fast only to quarrel, and to fight, and to strike with the wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is not this the fast that I chose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked? to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you, sh and you shall be like the watered garden, like a spring of water whose water never fails. This is the word of the God for the people of God. What happens when women organize for mission? Women have been in mission for centuries. In 1869, Methodist Episcopal church women learned that women in India could not be treated by male doctors so they decided to do something about it. They raised funds to send a woman doctor, Clara Swain, and a woman teacher, Isabella Thoburn, to serve women and children in India. Their bold, courageous action galvanized the movement that's still turning faith, hope, and love into action today. United Methodist women serve in local churches and communities and speak up against injustice. Our second and third mile giving supports mission around the world. When women organize for mission, the needs of women, children, and youth are placed front and center. Over 100 years ago, daring, giving United Methodist women deaconesses set out to serve by founding schools for newly freed African Americans after the Civil War, settlement houses for new immigrants, and mother's clubs in poor rural communities. Their work remains today as United Methodist Women support 96 national mission institutions with services like child care, parenting seminars, camps for children with special needs, and assistance to immigrants and survivors of human trafficking. When women organize for mission, their work extends around the world to more than 100 countries. And United Methodist Women regional missionaries engage in edgy, compassionate work in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Here at home, Mission U, a United Methodist Women transformative education program, promotes spiritual growth and Christian discipleship that is faithful, loving, and informed. Just as our poor mothers knew long ago, women's lives matter. When women are educated and empowered, the lives of their children, families, and communities improve and their nation progresses, because that's what happens when women organize for mission. And women still need to organize for mission, because a quarter of a million women die worldwide from preventable causes related to pregnancy. Climate change is responsible for five million deaths annually. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, and the top 10% of the U.S. population has twice the amount of wealth as the bottom 90%.
And as United Methodist Women continue to work on these critical issues, we also grow in our own most precious faith. We are a 150-year-old women's movement still saying yes to God's call to mission. United Methodist Women, you rock. Missionaries could not do what we do without you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Felicidades, mujeres metodistas. Happy 150. Good. I thought that was informative to me. <laughs> I'm Sarah McConchie, and I am, like Louise said, currently the treasurer of our local unit of United Methodist Women um, here at Raleigh Court. So we thought we'd start our presentation this morning with some very exciting financial information. <laughs> uh, yeah, so go ahead and put that first slide up. I am a corporate CPA by trade, so I understand facts and figures are not very exciting, but I wanted to show you these numbers because it could put into perspective the vast reach of United Methodist Women. Um, as you heard, in 1869, some women started a group because they had to send missionaries to India, and they pledged two cents each. Uh, today, though, there are approximately 800,000 members, as you can see by the slide, in the United States, and there are 41 active members here at Raleigh Court. And we'd love to see that grow. <clears throat> uh, go ahead to the next slide now. There you go. Um, this slide shows that most active members of the United Methodist Women make an annual pledge to mission giving. It's important to note that this pledge is in addition to any pledges that are collected by the United Methodist Church. And as you can see, in 2015, United Methodist Women raised over $14 million in pledges um, in the United States. The Virginia Conference collected over $755,000, which was second only to the Western North Carolina Conference. But maybe we'll win one day. Thought that it's a competition. <laughs> Here at Raleigh Court, we collected and dispersed $3,659 in pledges and special offering. Even though individual contributions are very relatively small, the pledges um, combine to be a significant amount of money, as you can see. I calculated it out, and um, that $14 million, if you divide it by the 800,000 people, it's only like $17 a person. And, you know, people, more people give less, but that shows that it's everybody that doesn't contribute a lot necessarily. <clears throat> okay, we can go ahead. Now I know you can't see this very clearly, but the video said their pledges support 96 mission programs in the United States. I know you can't make out the individual missions, but each dot on the map represents a mission outreach program. Now Wesley Community Center in Portsmouth is currently the only mission outreach program in Virginia supported by the National United Methodist Women. Although you heard from or from uh, Bonnie that there are also a lot of missionaries in Virginia, but the one program in Virginia is Portsmouth. And now, if you go to the world again, the pledges support 120 international missions. I know you can't make out the individual missions, but there are mission programs every place you see a pin on the world map. Uh, some criteria for being a United Methodist Women uh, funded program. Uh, well, what United Methodist Women does not fund is projects and programs that don't benefit women, children, or youth, or projects and programs that do not comply with the social principles and book of discipline of the United Methodist Church. And also, they do not fund programs administered by organizations that discriminate on faith, ethnicity, race, or gender. <clears throat> so every time you buy a bag of pecans, or get chocolate valentine hearts, or buy a tasty treat at the Grand and Road Christmas Parade, you are supporting these missions of the United Methodist Women, and we are grateful for all your support.
Good morning. As you can see from the video, United Methodist Women has a long and rich history of service with women, youth, and children as our main focus. As Sarah just mentioned, those bake sales, pecan sales, church dinners, individual pledges, etc., do really add up to millions of dollars to support the various community centers, clinics, and schools that we help to fund in the U.S. and around the world. With a membership around 800,000, UMW is the largest faith-based organization of women in the U.S. Isn't that amazing? when you think about it, that we have that. Our purpose emphasizes participation in the global ministries of the church. Therefore, we'll now take a closer look at the initiatives that are our expression of love in action this year. We saw them on the video. Those initiatives do change from time to time, but what helps us to focus what we're participating in, what we're donating to. So the first one is maternal and child health. And this, you can see, is a long-standing initiative going all the way back to 1869 when Dr. Clara Swain went to India. She was really the first fully accredited woman physician ever sent out by any missionary group to any part of the non-Christian world. So you could say United Methodist women were on the cutting edge even back then. The hospital that she established is still there today. That is a long history. In 2014, UMW and United Methodist Committee on Relief forged a partnership to improve maternal health as around a quarter of a million women do die every year from childbirth. That's hard to imagine. We, we can understand that maybe more in developing nations, but unfortunately that happens in our own country. Too. I hesitate to say that when we have so many pregnant women in our, in our congregation, but um, unusual things can happen. Um, Bruce and I lost a dear friend of ours in childbirth 30 years ago, so it's not unheard of. And that's something that UMW is still working to change and to eradicate that problem. In 2015, UMW gave more than a million dollars to health care programs for women and children in the U.S. and the world. And these funds cover more than just maternal health. They also cover child protection, cancer screening, family planning, crisis intervention for domestic violence and assault in war, mental health counseling, and so on. So it's a wide range of services that go under maternal child health. Two local examples that we all know about for of assistance for children, which help the whole family of the working poor, certainly are the Community Outreach Program and the Henry Fork Service Center in Rocky Mount. These programs both provide a safe after-school program for children, and we know that COP provides dinner, and all three UMW groups have worked in that, as well as other groups in our church for COP. The national UMW budget provides about 15% of the budget for Henry Fork, so as well as volunteers to help them with their various needs. So we have a fairly substantial stake in their, in their um, programming. Now we'll move on to the next one, which is climate justice. Certainly a big issue currently. UMW has launched the first Fund established by a women's organization that is dedicated to carbon issues. And it's called simply the Women's Carbon Fund. I didn't realize that until I started researching these initiatives, and it made me feel proud that we had established such a fund. And in that fund, there are projects that help to lower CO2 emissions that contribute to climate change, Projects that help women and communities whose lives have been affected by climate change adapt to those new conditions. And they also work on solutions for greater sustainability. When floods or drought strike, women are often the first to feel the impact on their income and lives as they often manage securing the food and the water. And this, of course, as we know, tends to hurt and hit third world countries as unfortunately the people who are the least responsible for greenhouse gas emissions are disproportionately affected by the results. Currently the U.S. is second 
after China in terms of pollution in the world. So you can see that climate justice is a very pressing concern for all of us to look at personally in our own lives as well as collectively as a church. Within the UMW group itself, there's a movement called Be Just, Be Green. And it helps us to be environmentally sensitive in our meetings, in our lifestyles, and the venues that we pick for conferences and group meetings. Through our reading program, we have many books where members can learn about the global impact of climate change and the steps that we can take to promote sustainability within our home and our community. UMW has actively demonstrated their environmental concerns by being present at the Standing Rock site and supporting against the development of the pipeline. They've also marched in protest against fracking. And very currently, UMW is helping to co-organize the National United Methodist Caretakers of God's Creative Concert, excuse me, conference in Arlington, just taking place this coming Saturday right before the People's Climate March. So we will be there focusing on that issue. Now we'll look at economic inequality. Another concern. In the past 35 years, there's been a major shift in incomes and net wealth within our country. The top 1% has grown 185% while the rest of us have averaged only 13% growth in income. We saw a lot of demonstrations to that effect recently about the top 1% and how the rest of the country is not quite catching up. Women are only 46% of the workers, but they make up 75% of the low wage workers. That's a stunning fact. Racial income inequality continues with families of color earning less than white families on the average. Despite laws requiring equitable treatment for employees regardless of gender, religion, or ethnicity, women continue to be discriminated against by being paid less than men for the same work in some cases. And since women are more often to be the primary caregivers, not only of their own family, but sometimes of aging parents, they must cope with the additional stresses of trying to provide for a family on a limited and undervalued income. UMW is also a longtime member in the National Farm Workers Ministry, which supports farm workers in the US through advocacy, shareholder actions, corporate campaigns. For example, members of UMW in Florida have rallied many times to hold fast food chains and supermarkets accountable for both working conditions and wages. We'll move on to our fourth initiative for this year, which is mass incar incarceration, or it's also known as criminalization of people of color. Currently, there are 2.3 million people in the U.S. who are in prison. That's a large group, to say the least, when you think about our total population. This is a 700% increase since the 1970s. The U.S. incarcerates people five to eight times more than other liberal democracies that are our equivalent in the world, which is due in part to the war on drugs. People of color are more likely than white Americans to be arrested, convicted, and receive longer sentences. UMW has been focusing awareness on this issue through many articles in our magazine, which is called Response, which is down in the library. Anyone is welcome to read that. And also through the reading program, the books that we have that talk about different um, racial differences in, in incarceration. Restorative justice is a new philosophy that's coming around. It's an approach that I read about in the Response magazine, and it has helped to turn the tide of mass incarceration. One example of this can be seen in Missouri, of all places. We don't often think of Missouri on the cutting edge, but they are taking a step forward in restorative justice in their criminal system in the whole state. 
So the Missouri Department of Corrections is committing to see that the perpetrator of a crime repays his or her debt to an individual or family members. Each prisoner is held accountable. And they do this through community service, financial retribution, and even meeting with the victims to understand the impact of their crime. I thought this was an amazing concept, that they would actually meet with the victims and that the victims were courageous enough to meet with those who had committed a crime against them. This program helps the offenders to develop skills and compassion, which is often missing for those who are committing the crime, that will help to serve to lessen the recidivism rate. So UMW continues to focus on promoting education to combat the high dropout rate and poverty rate within their communities in order to eventually change the culture of mass incarceration. So in summary, UMW provides women the opportunity to grow in their faith, to have fellowship with other women, and we do love to get together and share and support each other and pray for each other, and to be with other women who desire to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world and to minister within our church family here locally. We would invite any woman who's not already a member to join with us. You can see that we have a lot that we're focusing on that we feel is important to do and that we do care and support for each other. You'll find in your bulletin the contact information for each group. And if there isn't a meeting time that suits your needs or your schedule, we would love to help start another group. Please let us know and we will work with you. There's plenty of room for more groups of UMW within our church.